So first of all, identity protection, remediate use of risk through on-premise password reset. If I had a pound or a dollar for every time I've seen this and thought, you know what, we should really do this, I wouldn't be in front of you right now. I love this so much. And I think it's really going to help customers be able to deploy identity protection at scale. The concept of this is um, it allows on-premise password change reset uh, to also reset users' risk. Uh, and that means you can re remediate those risky users through your on-premise password reset and deploy those policies to automatically remediate. And that's so important because we need to meet customers where they are. Not everybody has fully deployed. <laughs>
especially when they've been trying to move their uh, device footprint from on-prem into cloud and trying to get into a Microsoft intra joint cloud native environment. Uh, we didn't have any solution for that as far as Labs is concerned. Although we've had an out-of-box Labs installer that had shipped like almost a decade ago, it was largely meant for on-prem domain joint environment, right? So that's one area that uh, uh, you know was was affecting the Microsoft Entra joint devices. And in terms of how we went about doing this, this was really a culmination of a lot of teams within Microsoft, starting with Windows, Microsoft Intune, and a lot of teams within Microsoft Entra ID. And the way we did this is we've really packaged this as a component that's built in into Windows. So customers don't really have to worry about how do I deploy labs? How do I get it onto all my machines and environment? And the good thing is we've really gotten it across all the, uh, the operating systems that are out there in the market, right, that we support. So starting with Windows 10, Windows 11, Windows Server 2019, as well as Windows Server 2022, right? Uh, and it went with the April security patch. So as long as you have that security patch installed, uh, you should be uh, good to go ahead and turn on laps, right? In terms of Microsoft Entra ID, uh, uh, you know, we support it for both Entra joint as well as hybrid. We understand customers need a consistent experience when it comes to managing laps. So we do make sure that we can support it for both cloud native as well as for your hybrid environment. And then the most important thing is about how do you manage these settings, configurations, policies that are associated with laps. And that's the device management piece where we have MDM support where you can use either Microsoft Intune or any other third party MDM. And if you have hybrid devices that are not MDM managed, you can go with the traditional group policy object uh, route, right? And the key thing to note here is we do uh, only manage a single local admin account on the machine. And we typically expect customers to not have more than one. So that's where we uh, you know, go about it. Uh, so moving on to the next thing, which is what are some of our core uh, scenarios right that we have really enabled in this uh, general availability announcement right so you start off with turning on windows labs and this has to be done in two places one is a tenant-wide policy and the other is a client-side policy right so the tenant-wide policy is a global setting you do it just once and then you fire and forget the client-side policy gives you the control to really roll this out in a controlled fashion, right? So if you want to go enable labs in a, in, a, in a limited environment to test the whole experience, test it out, and then go broad, this client set policy allows you to do that, right? And then what does the client set policy entail, right? We have a lot of policies, uh, settings around, what do you want to uh, give your name to the local administrator account? What is the age that you want to have for your password? That is how often you want to have it rotated. What's the length, complexity, yada, yada, right? There's, a ton of settings. The key one is also around uh, allowing a manual password rotation, right? So if you want to do on-demand rotation of a single device or a group of devices, you can do that, right? Then we start off with once you've rotated it, obviously you want to be able to go ahead and recover the password, right? And recovery is through Microsoft Antra. We have also integrated with Microsoft Intune, and then you have other means to use APIs and so on, right? So that's the other thing. Uh, we have built some experiences in our portal to allow you to enumerate all LAPS devices. So you can go and pick a specific device that you want to uh, require a password and then go you know, log in and do whatever you need to do. We also support additional uh, mechanisms through other Microsoft Entra ID capabilities, like you can create a custom role. Uh, the built-in roles we support are global administrator, uh, cloud device administrator, and Intune service administrator. But if you want to go ahead and create your own custom role, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, there are additional audit logs that we enable in Microsoft Antra to uh, allow you to go uh, look, at, look at the updates in terms of who has requested password, how many times it has been updated, and a bunch of things, right? And lastly, if you want to secure and make sure someone who's recovering that password is prompted for additional authorization like MFA or strong auth, you can always uh, configure conditional access policies, right? So uh, moving uh, next is I'm going to quickly just talk about settings. I'm not going to go through each and every settings. Uh, you may want to go ahead and uh, show all. So these are a bunch of knobs we have uh, in terms of where you want to back up your uh, password. That's the key setting that you want to enable uh, in terms of uh, turning on Windows laps with Entra ID. Uh, but then name, age, all of that. But there are some key settings in terms of post authentication actions and authentication reset, right? This is really important because this allows you to control the behavior you want once the local admin account password has been actually used to uh, 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 authenticate on the machine, right? That's when you can go ahead and basically say, uh, hey, you know, after 
four hours, I want the machine to be, you know, to log off, right? So that means you're not letting the user stay in as a local admin perpetually, right? So you have, you can control some behavior around uh, what should be the action you want to take, whether you want to log off, reset, uh, reset and log off, or just reset and reboot, which is a pretty invasive one. And after how much uh, time after the user has actually used that password, right? So, so I feel that's a very cool setting for additional security that you want to, uh, to have on, in your environment. Uh, the next thing is really, you know, a lot of times we get questions on uh, uh, licensing, right? Uh, who can use uh, uh, Windows Labs? And the answer is it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you have a Windows license, you know, uh, like a pro, OEM, et cetera, you know, basically you can use Windows Labs. We don't require a specific type of Windows license, right? As long as you have any Windows license, you're good, right? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, if you're using uh, Microsoft Intune for targeting uh, labs policies, obviously you're going to need a Microsoft Intune license. Uh, but when it comes to Microsoft Enter ID, the baseline feature set, which is about enabling labs, being able to store passwords securely and retrieve them, use audit logs, those are all free, right? You don't have to pay a dime for that, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to use capabilities like conditional access or custom roles or you know, administrative units, that's where, you know, these are our premium features. That's where you would end up, uh, you know, uh, purchasing the premium license from uh, Enter ID. Uh, the next thing really is, you know, I uh, I think those were the slides I had. Uh, I'm going to quickly, oh, sorry, uh, uh, we should also talk quickly about, hey, now that we've already uh, uh, announced uh, uh, general availability, hey, what's next, right? What's coming uh, for Windows Labs V next. So we've received quite a, a bunch of feedback around uh, account creation management. So today we expect that account to be already present on the machine that you're going to be enabling for Labs. One of the feedback we've received is, hey, if the account doesn't exist, can Labs go ahead and just create it, right? So we are actually working on uh, a design for how we're going to go manage this automatic account creation, as well as giving you additional knobs, whether you want to keep it in enabled state, disabled state, and so on. So that's a very cool feature that we expect to uh, uh, to basically uh, release sometime next year. Uh, we also want to make sure a lot of customers want to keep their local admin account disabled when they enable it with Labs. So we also want to go ahead and add additional capabilities where we automatically enable Labs when you boot Windows in safe mode, uh, safe, like safe mode, because that's where if you want to go debug or if you want to go troubleshoot any issues, you want to be able to use the local admin password to do that, right? So that's another uh, area we are uh, looking into. And additional feedback has been around, can we get additional auditing on if uh, accounts being used, you know, when was it used and so on. So we have additional trail of who is actually logged in into a machine with that particular local admin account and so on. And then some customers have asked for self-service password recovery where they don't want to have uh, you know, uh, IT help desk involved all the time. So they want to have JIT-based, just-in-time-based self-service password recovery feature. And then we're also looking at some enhanced reporting to provide additional details or insights of how Labs is behaving within your environment, right? So that's sort of uh, where we are. So I want to quickly uh, check with Grace and Jorge as to how we are doing in terms of demo, because I wanted to just quickly walk you through the experience. But again, if we don't have time, we can always come back and schedule a deep dive and, and go through all of it. So. Uh, Jorge, Grace, how, how are we doing on time? Yeah, yeah, we're good for time. I think we'd love to see a quick demo. So whilst you get that set up, I think from my perspective, what I really love about this feature update is we're bringing zero trust really to life in a cloud first environment outside of just the identity control plane, you know, looking at those devices and how we can do just in time elevation um, and everything that we talk about in terms of the three pillars of zero trust with least privilege. And I also really like that we're finding where customers where they are in terms of version. So we, we are updating with the April uh, security update and Windows 10 because we know it's not as easy as just updating, you know, control delete your devices to Windows 11 in a large <laughs> enterprise estate. And even better, this can be rolled out in phases with client side. So yeah, I'd love to see this um, in, you know, in a demo. Sandeep, if you want to go ahead and yeah. um, share your screen. Yep. And just are to you, add something, good? imagine, imagine all of these uh, functionalities and all of this flexibility that we have compared to what a lot of people were using before, like that, same password for all of the local admins that somebody had on an Excel file, right? So think about all of the flexibility. I think this is great, Sandeep. Thank you for sharing. Let's just yep. go ahead and see a demo, I guess. 
Yeah. So, uh, so what I'm seeing right now is I can see share only one tab at a time. So I have to go back and keep sharing unless there's a way to share all the tabs. Do, do, do any, does anyone know or should yeah, I just be carry doing it as you are. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So the first thing, like I said, is you come in here, uh, in the Microsoft Entra portal admin center and under device settings, you're going to see, a, a an option to go enable, uh, you know, uh, local administrator password solution, right? By default, this is uh, disabled, it's no. Here in this, uh, I have turned it yes. So this is a this is a requirement. This is absolutely needed as a first step to go enable uh, Windows Labs tenant-wide. Once you have done that, sorry, I have to keep doing this, which I'm not a great fan of, but I'll just keep doing this, which is the next screen is gonna be on, uh, Okay, it's going to be on the endpoint security, right? So this is where, you know, if you are a Microsoft Intune customer, uh, you you come to the endpoint security. So you go to uh, Microsoft uh, Intune Admin Center. You go to endpoint security. There's an option under Manage called Account Protection, and here I've created one. But you know, here you get to create a lapse policy. You can choose the platform. You can say I want to create a profile for Windows uh, Local Admin Password Solution. Uh, labs configuration and then I can go next and this is where you get to set all of these settings right you can say where do I want my password to be backed up uh, this needs to be this is still the old string will go updated but this is really where you're backing it up to Microsoft Entra uh, you can say what's your password age by default it's 30 I can go and change it to minimum seven and then bunch of other things, right? Complexity, and if you don't configure this, we we still go with the uh, the, the complex uh, password and so on. So th these are just a, a quick way to go look at you know all the uh, knobs that that are available for you, right? Now once that's all done, uh, you know you're in business, right? The the actual uh, password will start to rotate, right? Like uh, you know the client will get all the instructions from the Intune service that you need to go and. Uh, uh, set uh, this particular uh, password, and then it will go rotate it. It will go reset uh, and and keep it in uh, Microsoft Antro, right? And this is where you come here, right? You you have this uh, option under devices called local administrator password recovery. This is where it will list you all the devices that are enabled for Labs, right? I just have one, uh, three devices. I just happen to have one that I recently rotated. I come in here. And this is where I can go to the local admin password recovery option. And it has the ability for me to uh, see the password, right? This is, again, I have the right permissions. I can go do a copy, and then I can go RDP into that particular device remotely to basically connect using the local admin password, right? So very straightforward, very uh, uh, you know uh, seamless experience, and the same experience can also be uh, uh, used from Microsoft Intune. And then there's additional auditing reporting that, you know, I don't think we have time right now, but uh, we are more than happy to come back and do additional deep dive if uh, audience is interested in, in this particular topic. But uh, that's all uh, what I had for today. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And yeah, I mean, I don't want to speak for the whole world in the audience, but yeah, let's get you back. I think a deep dive on this, we've so shown how much, uh, you know, importance uh, is you know not to be ignored in this update so yeah let's get that booked in and for the meantime we know that you're coming back on the 13th of December to talk to yeah. us around all the amazingness that is passwordless SSO for AVD and Windows 365 so if you're that way inclined put that in your diaries so thank yeah. you very much Sandy yeah. um, just, if anybody yeah 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 sorry just one point before I before I drop uh, so one thing is we've seen huge adoption right even when we were in public preview we have seen huge adoption of Windows Labs so if if you haven't enabled it, I highly encourage you to go try this out, use it. It's going to keep your environment safe and it's going to keep the bad guys out of your uh, you know, organization, right? Or out of uh, compromising any of your uh, devices. So please go try it out and let us know if there's any additional feedback you have. Fantastic. Thank you. Perfect. So good. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, Thank you. Great. So let's switch gears here a bit. So uh, don't forget, we are here live. Um, so if you do have any questions for us, feel free to drop us a note. 
Shout out, Arvin. Hi, nice to see you. Um, so we're going to switch gears now and we're going to talk about all things conditional access. Um, and then I'm going to hand over Jorge to talk through the rest of the updates. We're going to try and get an update in per two minutes. And then we should make our time. So start your clocks now, folks. So conditional access. Um, it is an ever faithful control plane. I love conditional access. I think it's one of the best things since sliced bread. Um, yes, you can quote me on that. So when we talk about conditional access, historically, you know, customers have known what their basic, you know, top three or top five conditional access policies should be, uh, whether that is enforcing a specific controls for registering for MFA, whether that is uh, securing high business impacting apps or uh, more secure apps to say SOAR devices or to certain network locations or to even require through MFA for a user to be physically in a country um, to, you know, for example, if there's export control laws uh, to be able to access certain resources. But of course, the, because conditional access templates are so flexible and so highly configurable, sometimes it can be so difficult to figure out where to start, especially if you've been on the Microsoft Entra journey for a long time, uh, whether that's months or years. Um, over time, things may have changed, especially if you initially put in conditional access policies during the pandemic. Um, you know, it may be worth going back and review those. But what we've now come out with in GA is this concept of conditional access templates. So these are based on our findings and recommendations within Microsoft. So not just identity, looking at zero trust and our security uh, teams. They're predefined sets of conditions and controls that give you the most convenient method to deploy new policies in line with what how we think you should. Of course, the importance being there is you can um, configure them yourselves. This is just a starting point for you. And that way, you know that these policies and these templates are a true reflection of what we say is the modern best practice for securing your assets, uh, for promoting security and, of course, optimizing access for your hybrid workforce. And so we've organized these conditional access templates into a handful of scenarios. And those five scenarios are for secure foundation. So that's being brilliant at the basics. It's zero trust. So in line with our three pillars of assume breach, explicitly uh, verify every authentication authorization request and least privilege, um, as well as in the, uh, the group of remote work where you can't assume they're physically connected to a network or physically in uh, one of your uh, offices. The fourth being how to protect your administrators. We've got to look after those admins with elevated privileges. You know, it's one thing. Um, to have somebody's user account potentially uh, compromised, but admins, that's a whole load more pain. So we've got an increased group of templates to add even more security to those, um, as well as emerging threats. So emerging threats is quite a uh, broad thing, but it's, uh, you know, an example of emerging threats may be using things like identity protection to make sure that you're aware of all of the, the threats that are emerging and how you can protect yourself. So um, I want to walk through a, a great update that we have in one of the templates that may not have come across your desk yet, which is uh, requiring phishing resistant multi-factor authentication for admins. Uh, we know, uh, and if you don't yet, not all MFA methods were born equal um, between SMS and voice all the way up to FIDO2 phish Fish resistant credentials. Wow, that's a mouthful at uh, half five on a Friday, on a Wednesday. Um, we know that they're not all equal. So to access certain high privileged um, accounts, we may uh, and we do recommend that you move your admins to use for fish resistant multi-factor authentication methods. So this template is set up ready for you to use um, and you can use our uh, latest conditional access auth strengths feature within the control plane uh, in the conditional access policy blade uh, to require those in order for that user to be successfully authenticated uh, to whatever um, app that is. So what would you like to see in templates? Are you using these? Are you thinking about m moving or doing a review of your existing conditional access templates? We'd love to hear from you. This also works really well alongside the dashboards that we've got, which kind of highlights you where you may have assets or users that are potentially uh, not protected by conditional access templates.
Yeah, and great. So if you if you let me, definitely a great starting point because it's something that you know working with a lot of customers and at different organizations, it's a common question like, where do I start? What type of policies do I want to set up here? Uh, what is Microsoft doing for those policies? How are other customers protecting against attacks with policies? So here's where you start, right? We this is an amazing way to kind of like set that template, see what is the recommendation based on those categories, and take it from there. Yeah, thank you. Additional by the access. way, by the way, uh, something that uh, I, I would recommend to everybody: if you can like and subscribe the show before, you know, we go more uh, into all of the, the other features that we want to talk to you because it is important for us. We we understand and we like to hear your feedback about the things that you want to see here, the things that we need to improve. But for that, please like us and subscribe us. Thank you. Shameless. I love it. So next up, um, we've got a slightly more admin centric view for conditional access. So we hear a lot of feedback from customers about, you know, they love conditional access. They love the, the flexibility and how highly configurable it is for them. But um, it wasn't going far enough, especially when we talk about the uh, infinite uh, amount of portals we have, let alone the ones that administrators need to use. And so what we've done is when a CA policy targets the Microsoft admin portal uh, and the cloud access policy is now enforced for the Azure portal, the Exchange Admin Center, the M365 Admin Center, as well as M365 Defender, admin, uh, Entra Admin Center, Intune Admin Center, and the Microsoft Purview Compliance Portal. And the reason why we've done this is we don't want to leave any gaps. Uh, we know we've got lots of portals. Uh, we need lots of portals. Uh, I know it's hard to imagine if you live and breathe identity why you wouldn't just have one portal for everything. Um, but if you are just focused on one feature, one product, one uh, part of the Microsoft security or M365 suite, uh, you know, you do like your own portal. So now as an identity administrator or somebody who works in security, you don't have to know how many portals. In fact, you really don't need to care how many various different admin portals we have in Microsoft. You could be safe in the knowledge by targeting those Microsoft admin portals with conditional access, that when you are applying conditions to those portals, we really are covering all of those admin portals. So if you haven't come across this yet, please do go take a look. Um, as you can see here, it is um, under Microsoft admin portals when you uh, select the uh, cloud app for it. So take a look, review your existing policies for admins, maybe even have a go at um, reviewing the new templates as well, seeing if there's one that's more suitable for your admins and trialing and testing this. Uh, you can start in report only if you want to, to see how many people in your organization for administrators are using these various admin portals and then just, just turn it on, just like that. So next up, we're moving away from making admins life easier and we're moving into the world of making users life easier. Sometimes it's hard to think about not being an admin um, and to think about just being somebody who, whose day job is not actual technology. I find it hard to get my head around. Um, so here we, again, much like the many portals for admins, we do have many portals for users. So the My Account portal is the one single pane of glass, she says with a pinch of salt, uh, where users should be going to um, view, edit, and update uh, their information, including security information and resetting passwords and controlling where they may be guests in other tenants or organizations from Teams. So now you can target that My Account portal um, using conditional access. Um, and that's really going to help manage your work or if you're an education school accounts by setting this up for being able to target security information. So you could say in order to register for security information, you don't need to use that tick box anymore that was in CA. You can target this whole portal and require certain conditions, whether that's on a managed device, on a, a trusted network, uh, even better using fish resistant credentials if they want to uh, you know, add another piece of security information. Uh, the world is your oyster now. Uh, and so you can get to the My Account portal from the current version of, um, you know, in any of the browsers. So that's myaccount.microsoft.com. And the last update from me uh, is actually moving away from conditional access, even though I'm so passionate about it, is mobile application management for Windows using Microsoft Edge. So 
Windows MAM app, uh, extends MAM application configuration and protection capabilities to Edge um, on Windows, including admin experiences, policy lifecycle management, and client for application and Windows Defender checks. So MAM is enforced via conditional access before allowing resource access on Windows, which ensures only MAM protected Edge uh, browsers can access protected resources. Now that's a mouthful. What does that really mean? So historically, um, we are aware that not every user in your organization is given a corporate mobile device where you can enforce that mobile device uh, to be enrolled and managed using, say, Intune or your uh, mobile um, like, uh, oh my gosh, I completely lost the word. Uh, alternatives to Intune <laughs> that you may have in your estate, right, that we interact with, um, you know, we know that that's not possible for all uh, users. And in fact, in some countries and in some industries, there are um, regulations that stop people actually being forced to use their personal mobile devices for accessing corporate resources. And, you know, that is completely okay and i uh, you know having spoken to a lot of people that um work with these uh workers protection um kind of rights I, I i understand it and so that's where mam comes in in the event that you do have users where you can't enforce enrollment of the whole device and that now extends to windows devices not just mobile devices is you want to not stop them from accessing all resources because there may be a good reason for example on a uh, monday afternoon okay this is a classic one right i don't have my work device enrolled or managed um but i'm out and i'm doing my weekly shop and i need to figure out realistically uh do i want to buy lunch for four th like four days of the week on campus or do i want to take some packed lunch i know let me check what's on in the canteen so i need to go to sharepoint so I may have a list of tag SharePoint sites that are low business impact. They're not classified information. If your lunch menu was going to end up on the front page news, well, it wouldn't be front page news unless you were serving something really horrific. So realistically, I want to empower my end users to be able to, when they're out and about shopping, evaluate if they want to bring their own lunch or go to the canteen, just as an uh, example. And so now, not only can they do that on their phone, they can do that from their personal uh, Windows device using Edge, using these MAM controls. And that means that you can apply the controls that you want uh, within that browser to protect your access and protect your corporate data, but still empowering your customers uh, to access uh, data on the devices wherever they need and wherever they are, including if that's in Tesco on a Tuesday night, evaluating what they're going to have for lunch. So... That's uh, everything that I had for this week. Uh, so I'm just checking. We haven't had any questions. Uh, I hope you guys are still awake out there uh, and you yeah, haven't been just looks... exhausted by uh, my complete excitement about LAPS and CA. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to you to Jorge uh, to talk about uh, delegated user management using custom controls. Yeah, thank you, Grace. Appreciate it. And I bet that uh, most of our audience and the people that are watching this recording as well are waiting for me to start speaking instead of just nodding my hair, my head in all of the stuff that you have been sharing so far, which is amazing. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, so delegated user management, user custom controls. This is this is a, a good one as well. So let's take a step back a little bit into what a custom control is, right? So it's one of those things that allows administrators to go more fine grain uh, scopes. The scopes are just specific actions that you can take on all of those resources that exist in Enter ID and even Azure resources as well. So think about things, for instance, like uh, maybe a user or maybe an administrator that wants to change certain properties for a user shouldn't have the permissions to do other things, maybe manage authentication policies, where uh, in the past you may have a built-in role that is user manager that can do basically everything for a user. Then we can now create a custom controls where you can do that fine-grained set of scopes to say this type of role can only do specific things for that user. And that applies for a lot of other roles, right? Not only for users. We went GA on specific scopes that we created out there for custom roles for the user management piece. And I'm happy to share a little bit of the uh, of the uh, of the portal if there's time. Uh, it's just very simple to 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 create there. But the the scenario, as I mentioned, it's usually when you have 
uh, multiple, let's say, uh, administrators, multiple help desks, or maybe you have a help desk and, and a security team, and you want to kind of like change the type of permissions that they have to manage users. This is the way to go. You create a custom control, you find the type of tasks uh, represented as scopes or permissions to then create that custom role to say, if you hold, have this custom control then or custom role, these are the only things that you can do. And you can also, you know, use all of the other workflows that we have in place to control who can get access to that role or to that custom control. Um, so great. So let me, uh, what did I do here? Let's switch to the next one, which is sending group names in SAML tokens for SaaS applications. So this was a huge ask. There was a little bit of, a, uh, it was possible, but it was kind of like a hard to put those uh, claims and those tokens. So think about the authorization uh, process for applications. If you do authorization based on groups, then definitely you want to have a group claim on your application and your token. So with this going GA, we now give all of those admins of those SAML apps to send security groups, to send group names, to send uh, directory roles and, and all groups. And if you're concerned about token bloat, like I have a large organization and most of my users have, I don't know, hundreds and maybe thousands of groups uh, as membership. Uh, you can also filter those groups and you can also send only the groups that are assigned to the application to limit that token bloat uh, condition where maybe you're sending too many groups out there. So uh, this was the, this, this specific feature will display that group in different means. You can display the group ID, you can display the group name, and some of the other things that you can do. And it's very easy to configure. You just go to the group claims uh, menu on that SAML application and then pick whatever you need to do for that specific group claim, right? So uh, pick if you need the group ID, if it's a cloud group or if it's a SAM account name for the group from, from on-premises, all of the different things that you can do. Uh, so think about that authorization process when it comes to applications when you need to send those claims into the actual application or, or the token. And talking about claims, right? Uh, this one I feel like represented because maybe the audience will know, maybe some of you have struggled before with the same things that I was struggling before this, which is adding claims to an OIDC app without a UX. Maybe a lot of you will be study shaking if I say claims mapping policies, right? And, and all of the different definitions that you need to create and all of this stuff. So we want to make it easier for you. So we created a UX that you can add claims on the same way that you add claims today with some apps. That WinGA has been in public preview for a little bit. We received some feedback, we improved it, we put it out there. So what you can do here and what allows you to do better is through the UX, set up those claims do regular expressions with them, do group filtering, uh, do transformations. The same way that you've seen it for SAML apps, you can do it now for OIDC apps to modify those claims or send those claims through the JOT token or JWT, whatever you want to call it. How do you call it, Grace? JOT token? It's J JOT. JOT. Yeah, it is JOT. JOT, but it took me a while and I had to get told by one of our app dev team that that's what it is. It's one of those things where unless you say it out loud, someone's like, what on earth are you talking about? Uh, but yeah, I don't want to say wrong, so I go with JWT, and that's fine. So uh, I'll try to do it that way from now on. But uh, okay, so this is one of those things that, like I said, I I was so happy to see that our engineering team was working in all of these efforts because it definitely facilitates and aligns to the same experience, right? Why if why if I can do it for SAML apps, why I cannot do it for OIDC apps? And why is this a, such a struggle that I have to do all of these definitions in JSON format to put that there? Uh, that didn't go away. If you still have some sort of automation in place that you want to do, that's still there. You can still do it. But uh, we wanted to make it easier for those who are more used to have a UX for this and you want to, or are more familiar with that, or you just don't want to struggle with all of the things around the, the, the mapping uh, through, you know, JSON format, you can do it through the UX. Um, moving on, there's more stuff actually. So intra privilege identity management, also known as PIM for groups, uh, we released an API for it. 
so painful groups as well, you know, it's been out there for quite some time, but there was a problem, not a problem. There was some feedback that we needed more like, how, how do I do this on, uh, through an API? I want to automate it. I want to create my middleware so I can see what roles do I have. I don't want to give access to my users or my end users that have a possibility to activate a role through the portal. So maybe I want to do it differently. I want to create my own interface to do this. We created a, that API for you. So now you can actually manage the membership, the ownership, the assignments, request activation, and everything that you need for PIM through this API. Uh, the screenshot you see is just Graph Explorer as well, but of course you can set it up on, on your own application. Like I said, a middleware that talks to the API and we have extensive documentation on each of these functions, methods, and calls that we created to do every single action that you may take on PIM for groups through the API. So not the API for PIM didn't exist before. This specific one is for the PIM for groups API. So that was kind of like the missing piece. Once we released PIM for groups, we needed an API for that as well. So that went GA uh, this month, or actually last month. Um, I can't believe it's almost December, actually. <laughs> so uh, the next one is ServiceNow application for Microsoft Entry Permissions Management. It's now available in the ServiceNow store. If you are an organization that is using Entry Permissions Management to you know, identify your PCI scores, your permission creep index, all of those overprivileged users, all of those inactive users, and all of the different things that and great stuff that EPM does, now you can also integrate it with your ServiceNow workflow because now we have that uh, application in the ServiceNow store. So what allows you is that if you have ServiceNow and you control a lot of things through ServiceNow workflows and think about that connectivity and that extensibility that you can now do the same things without going to the EPM portal, do it through ServiceNow, create your workflows, have approvals, whatever the thing is, uh, that case and manage those multi-cloud environments uh, over privileged users and identify all of the things through this uh, app that you can now add into ServiceNow. So for all of you out there, if you have EPM, if you have uh, ServiceNow, go and find this app. This will be definitely a way to identify all of those over permissions on demand, which is probably one of the best things that I always forget to say. Uh, this is yeah. another so you can always identify, right? Because you can identify overprivileged users in many ways, but how about doing it on demand, which is one of the best things that EPM can do. Yeah, I love this. So as soon as I found out, so this, you know, permission on demand pod, it's, it's just fantastic. I mean, the majority of customers uh, have service now. Um, and in terms of having that ability to do just in time elevation with privilege, permissions on demand and have that all auditable through service now in terms of ITSM and have that across your whole Entra permissions management suite. It's fantastic. Love it. Beautiful workflow. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So auditing, which is something that I also didn't mention, which is thank you for reminding me that. So think about all of the audit that you can also do through this app now. So, uh, Amazing. So the next one, uh, and this is probably kind of like the last one, I think. So we updated, updated, or we did a great update into the all devices list that now you can actually do more capabilities to uh, filter those devices to find what type of joint type they have. What is the compliant device? Uh, are, is, are they managed through a, some sort of NDM? Uh, do they have autopilot? Extension attributes, administrative units. Uh, as you may know, we have you know administrative units that can uh, create this sort of container that you can put certain users and devices to delegate the control of them. So if you want to find out what devices are on a specific administrative unit with this update, you can also filter by that. So we added more more filters. We added something that is called infinite scrolling. I don't even know. Like, can you have infinite number of devices, Grace? It's, uh, <laughs> well, I think it's obviously limited to the object, isn't it? But I actually yeah. love lazy loading and infinite scrolling. It's, it's yes. from my old days of being a web designer. I love it. It's great. So yeah, yes. I'm glad that's been factored in. It just caught my attention that the infinite thing is like, okay, well, what if I don't have infinite number of devices? I just have a hundred, you know? <laughs> I but, don't know. I know, uh, I know a few organizations that have tried to get to an infinite amount of devices, <laughs> especially I bet through things like non, 
non-persistent VDIs. Like you, beg, you can literally hand it them out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. I'm pretty sure there's more than more than one. Uh, okay, and column reordering too. Like, do you have a you know certain preference for auditing those columns and do you just want to see and compare maybe the names with uh, the MDM that they're managed and the administrative unit just can just reorder them and just find whatever you need making it easier for our administrators or whoever needs access to do the list of all devices um, to kind of like you know find a better more friendly experience and and more flexible to see all of those type of things so uh, Grace, I believe those are updates. So I think we made it on time. We actually... We did. Uh, we did. We've yeah. actually got a bit of time left. We've got 15 minutes. So I don't know. Do you want to go rogue? Do you want to go off script? Should we do a quick minute purse line and public preview update? I'm into it if you are. I don't see why not. Yeah. Shall I, shall I yeah. kick off? Let's do it. Let's do it. Cool. All right. So uh, let me get back to sharing my screen. So as we mentioned, this is a big month for us um, in terms of announcements. So what you've seen so far has been our GA announcements. Um, as we move forward into Ignite, uh, which will be next week, and if you haven't uh, been aware of this, you can go to ignite.microsoft.com um, and you can uh, register online. You don't have to trek all the way to uh, Seattle. Uh, you can save all that commuting time uh, and all of those greenhouse gases by just viewing on demand. So uh, yeah, definitely sign up to hear the experts talk in more depth. But if we can have Nick, can you bring my screen in, please? We're, we will uh, try and do a minute per update. So first of all, identity protection, remediate user risk through on-premise password reset. If I had a pound or a dollar for every time I've seen this and thought, you know what, we should really do this, I wouldn't be in front of you right now. I love this so much. And I think it's really going to help customers be able to deploy identity protection at scale. The concept of this is um, it allows on-premise password change reset uh, to also reset users' risk. Uh, and that means you can re remediate those risky users through your on-premise password reset and deploy those policies to automatically remediate. And that's so important because we need to meet customers where they are. Not everybody has fully deployed SSPR and doesn't have it as just cloud only, and especially with password right back and other solutions that you may have. You can now just with quite literally the tick of a box, allow on-premise password change to reset user risk. So you can then uh, add such a wider group of customers and end users into this to be able to leverage all of the richness of identity protection signals uh, using conditional access. I think I was in a minute for that. Next up, uh, we talked previously about being able to target the uh, lots of admin portals and lots and now the My Account portal. So you can also manage and change your passwords in My Security Info now. And because you can target this through conditional access, it makes a much better end user experience for changing passwords. So based on whatever CA policy you have built, uh, your users can then change their password by entering their existing password. So this is not um, a reset, this is a change flow. Or if they want to authenticate with MFA and satisfy the CA policy, they can change their password without having to enter the existing password, which is the reset flow. So if you've had help desk calls, um, I've spoken to customers where, you know, there is quite a high failure rate sometimes with this flow, depending on the users and how they're used to working with this, is that please do look at this, evaluate the instant per day you have, get that business case set up and start testing, targeting, changing password um, and resetting it by targeting my security information. Next up, Microsoft Graft Activity Logs. Oh my gosh, when this came out to public preview, I heard an audible scream of uh, excitement from the SecOps community and the threat hunters and anybody that works in incidents. So this provides admins with that full visibility into all HTTP requests, accessing your tenant resources through the Microsoft Graph API. And these logs can be used to find activity from compromised accounts, identify anomalous behavior, or investigate application activity. And that's because, quite simply, the majority of the time, these attackers and these adversaries, they're really smart and they want to be really efficient. And the most efficient way for them to do things at scale um, is through APIs. And so being able to have access to those activity logs within your tenant can be included in part of your active assessment of what's going on in your tenant 
as well as helping with, hopefully it doesn't happen, but remediation and dealing with post-compromise, understanding that, uh, that chain of events that caused you to get there and how you can either isolate that issue or make changes in your environment to reduce that ha uh, the chance of that happening again. Yep. And think about also service principles, right? That maybe you created an application that is doing a bunch of these graph API calls and you want to also audit what type of calls that middleware is doing that service principle that application that is running all of these calls to get information from the user you can now audit it in uh in in, in the you know um, activity log and one thing that you can do as well as any of the other signing logs that we have in azure ad you can export it to the cm or your choice and then you or your own hunting uh exercises if you need to yeah and there is um you know we you can fully export all of these logs, um, as Jorge mentioned, into whatever your scene of choice is. We also do have uh, fantastic uh, run books and playbooks that were created by our uh, security teams at Microsoft that's in, now I've got to remember the language, I want to say Sigma, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong, uh, which is one of the most well-known, but clearly not that well-known that I've not remembered the language, uh, to in add those playbooks to whatever scene you've got uh, to be able to look at, um, you know, the most common attack vectors and threats uh, in terms of what we recommend to for activity reporting and alerting. Next up, trusted certificate authorities in app management policy. Well, isn't that a mouthful? <laughs> so this uh, enables admins to restrict the use of certs in apps and service principles to only the trusted cert authorities. So you can now create a trusted cert authority store, which inside that holds a collection of uh, authorities wherein each chain of trust is defined by their intermediate and root authority link. So this collection uh, in the store is later referenced in the app management default tenant policy, allowing admins to limit all applications in their tenants to use the same certificate authority, or in fact, create custom policies which serve um, as expectations, exception, sorry, to the policy that is the default for specific scenarios. If you do have an exception to the rule, uh, but it's an accepted exception, then again, you can add that as a trusted certificate authority. Yeah, think about all of those asks from admins that say, you know, the only way that I can do certificate authentication is that I, I mean, anybody could just create a self-signed certificate, uh, upload it to my application, and then that's it. I don't have any way to trust that certificate, or I don't even trust it. Like, uh, So this is the best way for those app owners to say, all of these applications or all of my applications can only use this trusted cert authority for certificate authentication. Yeah, trust no one, explicitly verify, and this is definitely in line with that. And one of my personal favorite. So I work quite closely with the Microsoft Enterprise, uh, Enterprise Verified ID team. If you haven't watched the 425 show Deep Dive on it, go back, watch it. It's fantastic. Um, so we have, this is huge, by the way. So if you've ever worked with Verified ID, uh, you know that you have to be a bit of a developer. And uh, because it's so configurable and it is uh, so customizable for you and also is moving away from the classic centralized model to a decentralized identity model. It can be hard to get your head around, um, even as an IT professional, um, and you do have to have a certain amount of developer background to really get your hands on the code and get this up and running. And we heard that loud and clear. And not all customers have the benefit of a development team um, or even a, a large enough team where they can train someone on this to get this deployed. So why should they not be able to use uh, the great uh, Entra Verified ID product suite. So now we have Quick Setup, and this is going to be talked about very heavily at Ignite. So if you're interested, make sure you sign up. So now with a single click, and it is a single click, admins can enable Entra Verified ID to issue verified employee credentials to employees so they can prove the company that they work for across the internet. So such Credentials can then be used for enabling granular attribute-based cross-tenant entitlements using governance, shout out our governance features, while reducing approval fatigue, automate re revocation and improve compliance posture. So this is a huge milestone for us um, and hopefully it will empower you if you haven't uh, previously tried or you haven't found it, the entry point to be a little bit difficult for you to revisit where you may be able to use Microsoft Entry Verified ID um, in your uh, environments and to benefit your internal users and your customers. 
I can tell you that I tested this the other day and I was like, I wish we had this before. I went through all of these other steps when I created I my know. lab. So <laughs> it, it is amazing. It's it is so amazing. funny. I know it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, well, you know, at least I'm glad I did it. I felt the potential pain <laughs> that our customers had to yeah. go through, but I'm, I'm so glad it's here now. Um, next up, you might be surprised, alarmed, if not slightly concerned to see this four letter word on the screen. So no, it's not what you think, it's Okta. So within Microsoft Entry Permissions Management, we have integrated with Okta. And I'm pretty sure if the walls have ears, there's probably some kind of automation saying, Grace is saying that word, why is she? Uh, so within Entry Permission Management now, we actually allow security admins to integrate with Okta during or after the AW, the account onboarding. And this feature allows management to read the AWS permission assignments to use via Okta groups and to provide more accurate analytics, effectively calculate permission granted. And as a result, because it's EPM, uh, you can have that precise permission creep index. Um, and this is, you know, a real show that, um, yes, we're Microsoft first, but we're not Microsoft only. We do know that there are competitors out there. And of course, one of the main drivers for customers using Microsoft Entry Permissions Management is the fact that it's cross cloud. So why shouldn't it as um, another fantastic bow in your um string in your bow for identity and access management control. Why shouldn't we integrate with other IDPs where needed? And, and that's where this was born. So this is in public preview. So if you are an EPM user and you have uh, chosen Okta or you have Okta in your estate, definitely take a look at this. Next up, with four minutes to go, let's see if we can get through this. Uh, again, for Microsoft Entry Permissions Management, we have AWS IAM, Identity Center Integration. This time it's a three letter word that you thought I'd never say. Uh, so this allows admins similar to Okta to get the full view of permissions assigned to identities via AWS IAM Identity Center. So by running the cloud formation template in an AWS environment, the admin allows entry permission management to read user and role access configuration data from that management account. And after a successful configuration, uh, Microsoft Entry Permissions Management can then read the data to again calculate the permissions and therefore um, you know, provide you with information about how you should be uh, changing review or, or amending that. Talking about um, creep index, within Microsoft Entry Permissions Management, we now have a beautiful permission analytics report PDF. Uh, I love this. Whoever designed this, I will buy them a coffee. It is absolutely okay. fantastic. It is beautiful until you see the PCI score being too high, but that's uh, true. The design is beautiful. <laughs> the content could be absolutely terrifying. And just oh, in case yes. you need another thing to keep you up at night, this is one. But in terms of gamification and getting the right buy in, especially in an organization where you may have to pitch a, a business case to get a project funded to do something about this, uh, you know, this is something that is really well uh, received with senior leaders um, and also non technical folks. Um, and so this PAR list findings across identities and resources in Microsoft Entry Permissions Management and can be directly viewed in the UI. It can also be downloaded in the Excel format or ex exported into PDF and sent to your senior leaders on a weekly basis to hopefully show improvement, if not to prove to them how much work you need their support in doing. And the report is available for all supported cloud environments. So that's AWS, it's Azure and GCP. And it can be downloaded for up to 10 authorization systems with just, just one click. Fantastic. And oh my gosh, with two minutes to spare, we've done it. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> we did it, Grace. Thank you so much for everything. A, an amazing way always to walk us through all of the different features. Uh, you're definitely a rock star showcasing all of these different use cases for all of the features. So I appreciate that. Uh, you make it easy for me just to be here and like I said, nodding my head and yeah, Grace is right. Grace is right. So uh, thank you so much for joining us into this episode for November. So that was what's new in Microsoft Entry ID in November. We have some upcoming shows as well. So, but first I want to remind everybody that like and subscribe our channels. Uh, we want to make sure that we... Uh, publish material, publish content, and do shows that you care. So also give us feedback. You can pass what's, uh, uh, you can, it's late. You can watch past <laughs> shows in our, uh, in our, in our channel, uh, the 421 Show YouTube channel. Uh, we stream live on multiple platforms and you can find all of the previous shows. So uh, like us, subscribe us. 
The next show is going to be on November 29th, I think. Yeah, thank you, Nick. 400 level on Microsoft Enter a join uh, computers and Intune. So join us. If you're looking into do all of these devices to the uh, what what is the Microsoft Enter Join devices and how to configure with Intune and how to do it better. We have that 400 level session. So join us on November 29th. We have a couple of weeks that comes with Ignite and then uh, Thanksgiving holidays. So we will see you again in November 29th. And Grace and myself will be here at some point next month. I think Grace, you also have an upcoming session uh, with, with, with one of our feature PMs. So uh, Grace, Closing thoughts. I think we're done. Yeah, uh, just thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Hopefully, you're enjoying these updates. Uh, keep the questions coming. If you've got a particular topic that you want us to do a deep dive on, feel free to shout it out. Don't forget to like and subscribe um, and sign up to Ignite. And we'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much. Thank you.